Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I guess we can start. <laughs> so, <clears throat> hello, uh, I'm Amélie from L'Effet Special, and I'm going to present uh, Grease Pencil Rules for Animation Productions. Um, so, some of you may know L'Effet Special. Uh, maybe you've seen my uh, colleagues uh, talk this morning about uh, the making of, of uh, the siren. Uh, but if you don't, it's an animation studio that's based in south of France, um, and it's been founded in two, 2015 using Blender since the beginning, and Grease Pencil since 2018. As for me, I'm a research engineer there. Uh, I, I've started in January of this year, and I've been uh, working with Grease Pencil and developing tools for artists and uh, animators there. Um, yeah. If uh, I'm also occasionally contributing to Blender, the uh, Blender code, and uh, may maybe you've seen me on the chat under the mysterious uh, pseudo of uh, Amélie. <laughs> so. so, in this talk, I'm going to show to you uh, some of the tools we've been doing this year, uh, especially with Grease Pencil. Uh, so it's there are two, two parts of this talk. In the first part, I'm going to focus on materials and colors and showing you uh, some uh, small and efficient tools that can be used for different purposes. And in the second part, I'm going to show you more exper experimental work we've been doing on strokes and surfaces. Okay. So, I don't know if you recognize these uh, images. Maybe you've seen uh, these characters uh, yesterday in the animation festival. Uh, this is Tinykin. It's a video game for which we have done some animation sequences for the trailer and also some in-game uh, sequ sequences. So here there's a bunch of characters. You can see the style of uh, the drawing. It's a very clean, uh, flat style of, uh, of art. Um, that actually, for each of these characters, there are lots of uh, different colors that are used. And one of the challenges we had was to um, define all these colors very in a clean way so that many different artists can use, use the colors uh, and don't make mistakes in the animation with these colors. <clears throat> actually, in Grease Pencil, uh, we use color as materials, uh, 2D materials. So the first uh, things you, you have to do uh, there is to create all the list of material. And then once you are drawing in Grease Pencil, you have to switch between them. Uh, as you can see in this screenshot, uh, the, if the list is very large, it can be tedious to find which material you, you want to use. And so many errors can be made and uh, it's uh, disturbing the animation process. <clears throat> so we were thinking of another solution for picking material. Uh, a more visual solution. Uh, uh, that's what I'm showing here. Uh, basically, you have your list of materials and you're gonna uh, <laughs> separate it in different color palettes uh, that you are going to define and uh, display uh, in context with an image. So that's actual uh, screenshots that was what you are going to see in the viewport of Blender when you're invoking the operator, the picker. <clears throat> so let me show you. Uh, so it's a demo of how it's working. I'm just going to turn quickly because I don't see the video. <laughs> so here you see how the materials are picked. Uh, you can also switch between palettes by uh, pressing the tab key as I'm just doing this. <clears throat> and there's also an editor for palettes within Blender. So you can, you can move material across the wheel, add pick lines, add materials or remove them. And you can also create uh, new palettes from scratch uh, directly within Blender. Um, it also comes with an import and export uh, uh, module uh, to uh, put it as a JSON file so that other people can uh, import your, your palettes and materials. I'm also going to show you a time lapse of uh, one of our uh, artists that's been working with it uh, on this project. So you can see uh, how. She uses it, uh, so she's doing first the lines and then uh, the fill uh, part. So it's, what's really interesting is that uh, she can work directly in the viewport 
uh, not uh, switching between uh, uh, viewport and list of material on the right, and uh, it's, it's quite efficient uh, to do it this way. <coughs> Okay, so it's perfect, right? No, no, no mistakes, <laughs> except for <laughs> maybe this little guy. So, <laughs> so here, the, um, this uh, character named uh, Nevus uh, was drawn with uh, the wrong materials, actually. <laughs> so we had to change it. And uh, it's quite tedious to do this, actually, because you have to go in edit mode and change every stroke of every frame of the animation. So um, we developed a fix-up tool in, for those cases. Um, so the idea is that you're also going to go to edit mode, select a stroke, and, and tell the, the tool how, what's the range of frame you want to affect uh, for the, uh, this as new assignment. Um, so what it's going to do is going to take your reference stroke and look in all the other frames another, like the closest stroke it finds within the same layer with the same material. <coughs> So to compute the closest stroke, we are using a measure distance called Osdorf distance, which is really standard measure for cl uh, curve uh, distances. But um, maybe it can be improved because uh, as you can see here, so I've assigned uh, from the first frame on the left the material and it uh, automatically assigned all the other ones. But as you can see, like the last one is not really correct. Um, so this is uh, caused by the Osdorf distance, and I think it can be improved, but uh, still we have this tool, it's useful, and if you want to change the distance, now it's quite easy, you just have to change the measure. And yeah. <coughs> so once we've done this work on material management, uh, creating palettes, and um, switching between them, we wanted to work on explore, um, color exploration. Like how do you do to, you have your palette, you have to char your character and you want to try out other colors. But you don't want to, dis to affect your existing ma materials. You don't want to destruct, uh, to kill your own work. So we've been working on a tool call, called Color Mapper uh, in which you can add uh, alternative color palettes into your set list of materials. So it can be used for many purposes. Uh, for example, if you want to create variations of one character, or if you want to maybe adapt your character to another lighting environment, or also maybe if you want to change the level of details in your, in your drawing. Uh, for example, if you, in one of the drawings, it's, uh, your character is really far away, then you may want less details in your drawing. So how does it work? Um, here's a, a screenshot uh, of the, the tool. So it's, uh, the tool is displayed in the middle. Actually, you have one, uh, this list with one line per material. On the left, you have the color of the actual material. And on the right, you have the, the color to which you are going to map it to. And actually, the add-on is creating and modifying modifiers, uh, grease pencil modifiers, uh, which is good because uh, it's, it works in a non-destructive way. You are not going to affect your materials. And for example, if you're using linked materials, uh, it works uh, the same because you're not affecting the actual material. <coughs> um, but yeah, the, the issue we had, like, it works uh, really nicely, <laughs> but it's not perfect in terms of interface because still you have to enter each material one, one by one and then choose each color one by one and you're doing it in the list uh, on the right side of the viewport and so it can be uh, a bit disconnected and not intuitive uh, compared to the, like the, the drawing at the viewport. So the first thing we, tr we tried to change this interaction is to use uh, presets it's the first idea. So the idea is that you have a list of material and you're going to uh, create a mapping by applying the same function to all of the colors. So I'm showing it on a really uh, simple example, which is grayscale. Uh, so, uh, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, uh, that's the demo of the, <laughs> the mapper. So, so what, that's what, what I was saying before. Uh, you add each material one by one and do the mapping one by one. Just. 
Yeah, so then you can hide it and you can change the mapping that you've done. Sorry. And now is the preset. So here I'm uh, applying a grayscale. It's like a filter, but you are just working with your list of material and uh, it maps every color to the grayscale uh, function. Of course, for grayscale, it's not really interesting, but you can think of other functions, more complex functions that you may want to apply. <clears throat> Another thing we did to improve in, uh, interaction was to be able to pick directly in the viewport the material uh, that you want to, to modify and you want to map, uh, add mappings and also uh, modify them. So that's uh, here a demo of how this works. <clears throat> and actually to do that, uh, we had to do uh, like a bit more of uh, development than expected <laughs> because uh, I, I think some of you are fam familiar with the Python API. Uh, there's a ray tracing function that's doing exactly that, like uh, picking what's under the cursor in the viewport. But unfortunately, it doesn't work for grid pencil object. <laughs> so I had to just uh, redo this. So we released it as a standalone add-on as well because I think it's uh, really useful for other things. So in this eyedropper add-on, <laughs> we are going to uh, just go over the viewport and see what's under the cursor. So what is the object, grease pencil object, layer, and material. <clears throat> so there are two modes in this, uh, in this eye dropping. Uh, the first one is on fly. Uh, so it's uh, in the, the top here. Uh, in this mode, you just uh, go along with the, the cursor and uh, it automatically shows you uh, what's directly under the cursor and visible. And if you, click, if you click on it, it selects the object layer and material that you are, uh, that's under the cursor. And in the other mode, uh, what I call on-click mode, you click in the viewport and then you can see all the list of stuff that's under the cursor, but also what's hidden. And you can see it in the order of visibility uh, in the viewport. And here you can uh, like change visibility of layers, uh, select materials, layers, and everything. <clears throat> so uh, that's it for the first, um, uh, first part of my talk. Uh, here I uh, sum up all these add-ons that I, I've been uh, showing to you. They are all in our GitLab. Uh, the code is available. You can uh, look at it, download it. Uh, please, uh, you can send us a, ma a message if you use them and if you find any issues. Or, yeah, the GitLab is, there, is here for that. <coughs> So now for the second part, I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about some more experimental uh, development that we've done. So the first one is uh, about strokes. So here we are going uh, to uh, we are working with an, in another project, uh, which is animating this uh, really cute uh, character, which uh, prefers to remain anonymous. So please respect uh, its privacy. <laughs> so yeah, so. Actually, this uh, animation is done uh, with a 2D rig that was developed uh, in the studio as well. And uh, we were wondering if it could be possible to uh, add some patterns in the dress of this character and what would be the best way to do so using Chris Pencil. So we don't want to do it uh, by hand, frame by frame, because it's really tedious. <clears throat> so, yeah. So the idea is that we can't really do a UV mapping in the same way that in 3D, because uh, you have these strokes uh, uh, that are 2D, <laughs> essentially. And so we came up with a solution that looks a bit like UV mapping, but it's really uh, redrawing strokes in the character. And it's based on these deformation grids that are computed uh, per frame in the animation based on the dress control here. So how do you compute this grid? <laughs> uh, so the idea, we are in the very specific case of a cone-like shape, which has four boundary curves. Uh, two of them correspond to silhouettes, and two of them correspond to border of the, the patch. Um, so we are going to simply swipe the silhouette curves along the border ones uh, on the left side and then on the right side, as I, I'm showing here, and then interpolate the two grids that we have. So it gives us one grid per frame, uh, which 
um, have a specific topology which is uh, guided by the resolution, like just the number of line and the number of uh, ro uh, columns that uh, you have in the grid. Um, then uh, the idea of uh, the, this, what I call the mapping, is that this cone-like shape uh, can be interpreted as a projection of a, an actual cone that will be in a 3D space, but we don't want to explicit this uh, 3D space, we don't want to create this uh, cone geometry. But actually this cone is the developed version of a, a template. It's like if you had a, a fabric on which you can draw patterns and then it's developed and that's what uh, you're, you're sketching. So we are going to explicitly define this template flat shape, draw patterns on, on them and then uh, put it into, into the sketch. To do that, we are going to also compute a grid on the template space that I'm showing in the right side. Uh, it's actually uh, quite straightforward. Uh, so the, the template has a, a dimension, as uh, you can see, the, the whole shape has a specific dimension, but within it, there's a visibility range. Uh, it's just what is visible from the cone in the sketch. And this, uh, during the animation, it can change. Uh, depending on how the character moves and uh, stuff, uh, this visibility range can, uh, can change. Uh, it's represented here with uh, purple lines. <coughs> so once you have those two grids, the correspondence between them is actually also quite straightforward because they, are, they have the same topology and you can just map uh, all the coordinates of the strokes from the template space to the sketch. So actually what we've, we are doing here is not like a, a texture mapping, it's really you, we are um, taking all the coordinates and redraw strokes in the sketch uh, space. <clears throat> and it's useful because then you also have a grease pencil stroke and you can edit them uh, in the same way uh, as any grease pencil stroke. So for the purpose of uh, illustration, I, I'm showing this on a really uh, coarse grid, but uh, Actually, uh, for the, in the sequence, we use a higher resolution grid uh, so that it's smoother. Uh, so what kind of animation can we do with this? <laughs> uh, I'm going to show you uh, four kinds. So the first one, I, I call squash and stretch. Sorry. It's basically, you don't change the visibility range of your pattern. You just uh, redraw another frame, and it uh, it has a different shape than before. So it's gonna squash and stretch, uh, like with the grid deformation, it's gonna move the patterns this way. <clears throat> the other one uh, is what I call rotation. So it happens when the character turns around in the the cone axis, and here you're just uh, moving the visibility range in the templates. Uh, so that's uh, yeah, that's a one example. <laughs> Um, the other one is uh, what I call a <laughs> very uh, simply visibility change. Here, uh, the character raises her arm and shows a bit more fabric than before. So you're not really turning in a thermal rotation, but you're just uh, expanding the range of what's visible in the pattern. And the last one, it's also a visibility change, but in the other direction. Uh, I showing, I'm showing it in this example of, uh, with a sleeve. Uh, first, she has her arm like this, so we can see the whole uh, length of the cone in this way. But then when she has an uh, arm like this, only half of it is displayed. So that's another type of animation. Um, let me show you some results. Yeah, so that's the first animation. Another one with a more complex motion. And for the last one, I've been, um, uh, I'm gonna show you after. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, I've been attempting not repetitive patterns, but really uh, putting buttons, a pocket, and a drawing uh, behind just to see if the location remains, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Ah, consistent, oh, sorry, oh, we're gonna <laughs> just. 
Yeah, so in the last one, I'm just uh, going to see if the location remains consistent through the animation, because uh, that's uh, something that we want to have, and we can't really see it with the, the, the repetitive patterns. Yeah. So all the buttons, pocket, and uh, drawing uh, behind is done uh, in uh, the template space. Yeah. So the result is not perfect, but still we have uh, some uh, really uh, um, good uh, improvement in terms of uh, rapidity, like quick. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we, you don't have to do it every single frame one by one by one, so that's uh, good. Okay, so the last um, work I'm showing you is now 3D animation. Um, here you also may have uh, seen this character. Uh, for those of you that were uh, in the animation festival yesterday. Uh, so it's a 3D animation and uh, it's, the style is a very realistic but also kind of stop motion like. So there are a few frames per uh, sequence and we wanted to add some uh, smear and FX uh, elements in the, in the animation but we wanted to keep this style uh, specifically that is uh, stop motion like. So we came up with the, this idea to draw these elements in Grass Pencil directly in 3D space and then have a tool that uh, just combines that to surfaces. And uh, especially for this project, uh, felt like uh, material surfaces with thickness, um, as you can see uh, here on the, the right. So how do you do that in Blender? <laughs> so. The first thing you can try is uh, convert uh, Grease Pencil to a path, so that's an operator in Blender, and then you can have it uh, filled. But uh, the problem uh, we came across with this, uh, first is that the triangulation is not really uh, topologically uh, um, clean, uh, as you can see there, and also it only works with planar curves, so if you have a curve actually in 3D space, it's gonna just flatten it and it's not really a result that we want. <coughs> actually, there's another way to do uh, like this with a bit of scripting. You can use the inner tri triangulation that's on the grease pencil object. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's what I'm showing here. Uh, you can see that uh, the triangulation is still a bit uh, topologically uh, not clean, uh, especially because it doesn't add vertices uh, inside the shape. And uh, as for 3D curves, it, it has a uh, result that is 3D, as you can see there, but uh, still the topo topology is not uh, really uh, neat and shows some uh, geometry discontinuities. <coughs> so we... Uh, developed another algorithm to create a triangulation uh, in 3D space. So I'm showing just an overview of the pipeline. Um, it's based on really standard methods, but we just implemented it uh, in Python. <laughs> so the first step is to compute a plane uh, to which you are, you are going to project the coordinates of the stroke to, so that you work actually in 2D in the first place. Um, so it's a yeah, standard method to, to compute this plane with the covariance matrix of the coordinates. And for this I used NumPy, which is uh, already, I think, uh, in the Blender Python. Uh, then I'm using uh, an external library, which is Triangle, maybe some of you know it. And it computes uh, meshes, uh, in particular uh, Delaunay meshes for 2D curves. So it creates a, a triangulation in 2D. And then you have a, a last part of lifting uh, that in, uh, in 3D. And for, for this, I implemented uh, uh, an optimization um, uh, that's uh, using the boundary as a constraint, like you're gonna move your, your vertices in 3D, use the boundary as constraint, and then uh, trying to minimize the curvature of the, of the surface. Uh, I'm putting here the reference of uh, the um, research paper that explains the method. Um, yeah, it's called Laplace uh, minimization. minimization. So here are some results. Uh, on the uh, right side, you can see our triangulation here. 
Uh, yeah, for the other shape also, it, it works well. There are more triangles than uh, with uh, the inner triangulation, of course, but uh, it's more uh, regular. And then for the, the 3D curve. Uh, so the only thing is that this last step of optimization is quite expensive. It's using um, also NumPy, a linear algo algebra um, library. And so it's smarter to only perform it if the curve is actually not planar, because uh, otherwise you're just wasting uh, time. <laughs> so, uh, the last steps are to add some um, thickness, maybe some bevel, and the materials that we want for the felt. We also added some particle system to put some, some um, hair, like uh, kind of hair on it. Uh, but that can be done with uh, like uh, modifiers and uh, materials. <laughs> Some uh, results that we have, uh, it's like a smear-like uh, uh, elements. You can see in the first row uh, what was drawn with a uh, grease pencil and in the last row what was uh, output by the algorithm. Um, what's interesting here is that the elements actually um, are really blended in the 3D space, they cast shadow on the character, and they react well to light. Yeah. So, yeah, that's for the, like, the ongoing work, because uh, there are many, many things to see, uh, to, to still uh, work on uh, with these two uh, works. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for example, for the stroke mapping, um, I'm, I'd like to expand it a bit, because I, I wanted to, the user to be able to draw directly, actually, on the sketch and then map it uh, back uh, to the template. I think it would be a better user experience. Uh, also, we have this project of uh, extending it to other kind of shapes. Uh, we were thinking, uh, for example, to uh, faces, so that we can add marks in the face and just follow the animation. And for the triangulation part, uh, we still have uh, some, uh, some things to fix, in particular for shapes that have holes that is not really uh, taken well into account for now. Um, yeah. So thank you. Uh, this, I'm just, uh, if you want to stay tuned of uh, the development we, we are doing, I'm just putting the, the links of La Cuisine, or technical blog, which uh, is supposed, supposedly going to be more active in the next few months. Um, and also, you can check our GitLab repo, because we put all, uh, all the code in it. Um, we also have a Twitter account if you want to <laughs> follow us. And yeah, thank you for attending. So I think I went a bit fast, so if you have questions, I think we have some time. Um, we did the uh, animation for this, but we don't have to show it for the moment. It would be asked to Flavio, my colleague. So the question is, uh, where are we in France? Uh, Montpellier. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess uh, that's it. <laughs>